In this series of videos, we will read the Care Certificate Workbooks, both what you need to know and what do you know now. This video covers Standard 13, Health and Safety, what you need to know, and it's over to my colleague to read through this workbook. The Care Certificate, Health and Safety, what you need to know. Standard 13, the Care Certificate Workbook. Health and Safety. Legislation relating to general health and safety in health and social care. The main reason for health and safety legislation is to protect people at work and those who are affected by work activities. Legislation, that is laws, is made so that everyone in society knows which behaviours are acceptable and which are not. Laws cover all aspects of our lives, including protecting the health and safety of people at work and those affected by work activities, including those who receive care and support. Legislation. This term is used to describe laws and the processes of creating statutory guidance on the legal term, on the legal rules that affect people in society. Health and Safety at Work Act 1974 sets out how employees, employers, and the self-employed must work in a safe way, giving every person on the work premises legal duties and responsibilities. As this Act is very general, specific, subject-specific regulations have also been put in place to help everyone at the workplace be safe. If we click on the link. Reporting of injuries, diseases and dangerous occurrences regulations 2013 are often referred to as RIDOR. Reporting accidents and incidents is an important part of your work in health or social care workplace. The most serious accidents and incidents are reportable to health and safety authorities. And that's the RIDOR link. The Management of Health and Safety at Work Regulations 1999 are about how health and safety is managed within a care workplace, including risk assessment, training and ensuring employees receive the information they need. And that can be found on that one. The Regulatory Reform Fire Safety Order 2005 sets out how every workplace must prevent, protect against fire. And that's that link. Control of Substances Hazardous to Health Regulations, COSH 2002, are designed to protect people from hazardous substances, that is, any substance that can cause harm or ill health. And that's the COSH guidance. The Manual Handling Operations Regulations 1992 cover the transporting or supporting of any load, including people, and how to carry this out safely to prevent injury. The Provision and Use of Work Equipment Regulations, PURA 2002, set out how any type of equipment is to be used safely. Work equipment needs to be checked and maintained regularly and employees trained in its safe use. In a care or health setting, equipment not only includes not only specialist devices like lifting aids, but also everyday things such as televisions. And if you have a look on the PURA 1998, Lifting Operations and Lifting Equipment Regulations 1998, LOLA, have specific requirements relating to work equipment which is used for lifting and lowering papers or loads. Health and safety policies and procedures agreed with the employer. Most employers have the health and safety policy which sets out how they will protect everyone who is affected by their business, including employees, visitors, contractors and individuals who access services. Even if your role involves working in private homes or individuals, you need to know what health and safety legislation applies there. Ask your manager about policies that are in place to support your health and safety and well-being in all the places of which you work. What all policies and procedures have in common is to tell everyone how to do something or what must be in place to make sure all people are safe. Policy. A policy is a formal course of action that everyone must follow. Procedure. A procedure is the way in which a task must be completed or carried out. Examples of procedures can include how to store and give out medication, how to provide personal care, how to lift and carry loads, what to do in the event of a fire, what to do to provide first aid, how to handle soiled bed linen. 
Policies must, must give clear instructions so that everyone is kept safe and no one is harmed through the work that is being carried out. You must familiarise yourself with your own workplace health and safety policies and procedures. Who is responsible for health and safety in your workplace? Health or social care worker. As a health or social care worker, you are responsible for taking responsible care of yourself and others in your workplace. You need to follow the policies and procedures of your employer and not act in a way which would cause an accident or ill health to yourself or others. You will probably work with a number of individuals who all have different needs and who require different types of care and support. Any task you do while at work must not put them at risk. An example of how you take reasonable care of those within your workplace would be to report anything that could cause someone to trip or fall, like a frayed carpet or a wet floor, and take action that you are asked to do. Others. Others could include anyone who could be affected by what you do, including your colleagues, the individuals you support, and their friends or families or other visitors. Employer. The employer has many legal responsibilities. These are likely to be carried out in line with managers. Their overall responsibility is to ensure the health and safety and welfare or well-being of all employees. The employer must make sure that this happens by putting in place policies and procedures and ensuring there is enough time and money to put safety at the centre of all tasks. Employees must provide a safe place to work, necessary training, appropriate and safe work equipment, others in the workplace. Health and safety at work is everyone's business. That means others in the workplace have a duty too. Everyone in the workplace should avoid any actions that could cause harm, act, cause harm to others, act respectfully and not cause any damage to property. You could always report any known health and safety hazards that might affect others. Health and safety tasks that require special training. There are a number of activities that you must not carry out, carry out until you have re received special training. Usually, such training would include some practical elements and assessments by a competent trainer. These activities include use of equipment such as hoists and lifts to move people and objects safely. Each piece of equipment that you will use will have instructions for safe use. Medication. There is legislation and guidance that controls the prescribing, dispensing, administration, storage and disposal of medicines. Assisting and moving. It is essential that you know about safe moving and handling so you don't hurt yourself or the individual. First aid. This is the immediate assistance given to someone who has been injured or taken ill before the arrival of a qualified medical assistance. If you have not been trained, you should get help from a qualified first aider or call an ambulance. You should not attempt first aid without training as you could make their condition or injury worse. However, you should also know your basic life support duties. See Care Certificate Standard 12. Emergency procedures for emergency situations such as fire, explosion, flood, building damage, etc. Food handling and preparation. This will help you to prepare food that is safe for individuals to eat and stop you from causing food poisoning. Working in unsafe ways, ways that have not been agreed with your employer and without appropriate training can mean that you are putting yourself, the individuals you support and others at risk of harm. Six C's, competence. To make sure that you are keeping the individuals you support as safe as possible, you should only undertake certain activities once you are competent to do so. Additional support and information about health and safety. There are, there may be times when you feel you need to know more about how to prevent accidents or ill health. Your employee may already have lots of information or procedures, so ask your manager if you can look at these and discuss them. Also, the workplace may have designated a health and safety person who can help you to find the information or answer a question. Health and safety law posters displayed in the workplace or leaflets provided to each individual are other ways of gaining more knowledge. Additional support and information can be found on the Health and Safety Executive website. Accident and Sudden Illness Accidents are caused by the risks found in the particular workplace. Risk assessments should be available which identify all the potential risks and steps to reduce the likelihood of them happening. Potential accident accidents could include 
slips and trips, falls, sharp injuries, an incident in which a sharp injury, sharp object, example, needle, blade, broken glass, or a cannula penetrates the skin, burns and scalds, injuries from operating machinery or specialized equipment, electrocution, accidental poisoning. As well as injuries arising from accidents, the nature of health and social care means that individuals may have existing conditions which can cause sudden illness. You may be faced with a sudden illness including diabetic coma, epileptic seizure, fainting, this might also be caused by an accident, bleeding after an operation or such as a nosebleed as well as from an accident, stroke, heart attack. If an accident or sudden illness happens, you must ensure the safety of the individuals concerned and everyone else who is, may be affected. All workplaces will have health and safety procedure to outline what to do in an emergency, and you must ensure that you are familiar with it. You must also be familiar with an individual's care plan. For example, if they are known to have a condition that could lead to sudden illness and how you should respond. First aid. There are three levels of first aid training. First aider, emergency first aid at work and appointed person. If you have not received training in any of these levels, you should not attempt any form of first aid, but must seek help immediately. Without specialist first aid training, you should not attempt first aid as you could make the injury or condition worse. For example, moving someone into a recovery position could make a neck or a spinal injury worse. Basic life support is different from first aid. You need to be assessed in basic life support as part of the care certificate standard 12. In emergency situations, remain calm and send for help by shouting, phoning, observe the individual, listen to what they are saying, try to find out what happened and reassure them, but do not move them unless absolutely necessary for safety. Stay with the injured or sick individual until help arrives, observing and noting any changes in condition as you will need to tell the relevant medical staff or others what they have seen. Do as little as you need to do in order to keep the casualty stable and alive until qualified help arrives. See basic life support in Care Certificate Standard 12. Complete a full written support and follow the agreed ways of working to inform managers, carers or family members who need to know. Risk assessment. A risk assessment helps the individuals to have their choices met in the safest possible way. Risk assessments are not only a legal requirement, but they may also provide clear guidance, any information on how to keep people safe and prevent danger, harm or accidents. They identify hazards in the workplace, evaluate the level of risk and put in place measures or procedures to reduce the risk. There are five steps to a risk assessment which you will need to understand. Identify the hazards of an area, a specific task or situation. Identify those who may be harmed such as individuals being supported, visitors or other workers and contractors. Evaluate the risks by looking at what methods are in place to control risks or reduce them. Record the findings of the risk assessments to help remind everyone of what the risks are and how to reduce them. Review and modify the risk assessment if and when changes happen to the tasks or workplace, changes may increase risks or reduce them. Hazard. This is something with the potential to cause harm. For example, soiled bed linen or clothing, spillages or bodily fluids and assisting people to move. Risk. This is the likelihood of causing harm. For example, picking up an infection from soiled bed linen, slipping on fluids from spillages or trapping injuries from using a hoist. Reporting health and safety risks. The most important part of hazard reporting is you act quickly and tell a manager or supervisor who can take action to prevent an accident or harm. It is a legal requirement that you do this. Once a hazard is identified, a risk assessment needs to be carried out. You should be familiar with your agreed ways of working for reporting health and safety risks. Agreed ways of working. This refers to an organization's policies and procedures. This includes those less formally documented by individual employees and self-employed, and formal policies such as the Dignity Code, Essence of Care or Compassion in Practice. Moving and assisting. 
Your role may include moving and insisting people and will certainly involve moving and handling objects. There are laws specifically about tasks that involve lifting, putting down, pushing, pulling, carrying, or moving by hand or bodily force. These tasks are governed in particular by the last three regulations in the list of legislation at the start of the standard in this workbook. Some work roles require the use of assisted beds and hoists to help with moving and assisting individuals. You must have proper training before using the equipment to, assure, to ensure that you use it properly and do not injure yourself or an individual. Other tasks that require training and an assessment of competence include supporting an individual to transfer from a bed to a chair, helping with daily assisting routines like bathing, moving on and off the toilet. You should always carry out moving and assisting tasks in the agreed ways found in your policies and procedures and the individual's care plan. Over a third of injuries in the workplace, which leads to time off work, are due to moving and handling. It is extremely important that specialist training on moving and handling is provided. This will prevent accidents and minimise the likelihood of injury to those individuals you support, yourself and others. Tasks. Some of the people you support may use medication and require support to store and take correctly. Others may be able to manage their own medication safely. Individuals who can manage their own medication safely should be encouraged to do so as this promotes their independence and makes mistakes less likely to happen. Information about the support and each person requires will be included in their care plan. Wherever, whenever you are dealing with medication, you need to be aware of the main points of agreed procedures about handling medication. Ordering. The process should be quick and efficient. Receiving. A list of medication ordered should be checked against that received. Storing. Controlled drugs, CDs, must be stored in a locked cupboard or might be kept by the individual is self-administering. Administering. Ensure the right person receives the right dose at the right med of the right medication at the right time. Recording. Use the medicine administration record, record MAR, M -A -R, which charts the administration of drugs. Make sure the records are clear. Transfer. Medication has to stay with the individual as it is their property. So if they are transferred, the medication goes with them. Staying with includes being kept in a locked cupboard if necessary. Disposal. Return unwanted medication to a pharmacy. Care homes must use a licensed waste management company. It may be that your role does not require you to work with medication and therefore you won't be required to undertake specialist training. However, it is important to know what your employer's ways of working are. Tasks like cutting or filing fingernails or toenails, continence, maintenance and assisting with medication can be carried out only if they have been written in the individual's care or support plan. That's why it's vital that the individual's needs and wishes are agreed and clearly written down as a care plan. So all workers know when and how to provide support for that particular person as well as whether the person has the mental capacity or mobility they need to manage themselves. You always have to obtain the individual's consent before carrying out healthcare tasks or assisting with medication. Detailed policies and procedures about handling medication. Appropriate training must be provided for health and social care workers who are required to provide medication. You are not allowed to remind about, assist, or give individuals their medication or carry out related healthcare tasks unless it is part of your role until you have completed the satisfactory past the appropriate training. This applies to inhaled medication or any medication that needs to be swallowed, medical creams or ointments, drops, cutting or filing nails or prompting or helping with injections, for example EpiPen. Except in the out any actions that are not covered by the individual's care plan. But remember, it is always necessary as it is always a necessary part of your job to work with your manager to help individuals change their care plan if necessary. As legislation on medication and regulated tasks is forever changing, you need to keep yourself up to date with current laws and guidance from NICE and from your employer.
hazardous substances in your workplace. Hazardous substances found at health and social care environments include cleaning materials, disinfectants, body fluids, medication, clinical waste such as dressings, contaminated clothes, towels and bed linen. Consent. This means to get the individual's permission. These substances can enter the body via inhalation, breathing in, ingestion, swallowing, injection, needle stick or absorption through the skin. For all products you use, read the hazard information found on the label. This will inform you about their hazards and help you to keep yourself and others safe. Dealing with hazardous substances. The workplace must have a secure and specific area especially for the storage of hazardous substances. Some hazardous substances should only be handled when the worker is wearing personal protective equipment, PPE. Your employer will have policies and procedures which set out when PPE should be worn, which will normally include handling clinical waste and some chemicals. You must always work with an agreed way of working to protect your own health and well-being as well as those around you. Cleaning products and disinfectants should be kept in the original containers as these give the manufacturer's instructions for correct usage. These instructions must always be followed. An individual may choose to transfer products out of the original containers in their home. For your own safety, you should only use products that are in their original containers. Identifiable human tissue must also be always be incinerated. Local authorities may arrange a separate collection for this type of waste from the individual's homes. Body fluids such as blood, urine, vomit and faeces must be cleaned up immediately. Disposable items used for cleaning the spills such as paper towels and gloves should also be disposed in the clinical waste. Clinical waste includes contaminated waste such as used dressings and contaminated personal protective equipment. This waste should be put into bags which identify it as a potentially harmful these are usually yellow or orange, and stored securely until it can be disposed of and set out in the procedures for your workplace. Many local authorities will arrange safe collection of clinical waste from individuals' homes if it has been assessed as clinical waste by a community healthcare professional. Some contaminated clinical skills, some contaminated cl Some, some contaminated clinical waste can pierce the skin and should be stored in sharps bins rather than bags to protect workers from injuries. You must always follow the agreed ways of working if supporting a person in their own home. Be familiar with any risk assessment for disposing of sharps there. Sharps should normally be returned in an approved sharps box to the place where prescribed. Waste is considered hazardous if it's potentially harmful to humans or the environment. Disposal must be done in a way that avoids any danger or harm. Your employer will have procedures in a place of the storage and disposal of hazardous waste. Linen, which has been contaminated with bodily fluids, should ideally be washed immediately if you are supporting a person to live in their own home. In the health social care workplace, it should be placed in an identifiable bag and placed in a hot wash, separate from other linen. There will be agreed ways of working, which may vary from person to person, for washing clothing. Fire safety. Fires are a hazard in any workplace and can lead to injury or death. Basic fire pre prevention measures include no smoking or naked flames within the building. Do not have fire doors propped open as this will increase the speed in which the fire spreads in the building. Do not allow waste to accumulate which could provide fuel for the fire. Check escape routes are not blocked and keep them clear of furniture or boxes. Check that appliances and plugs are turned off to help prevent the electrical fire from starting. If you are supporting someone in their own home, these measures may not apply. You can support individuals to get advice to make their home safer, but you must respect the choices they make. For example, if they choose to smoke or not have a smoke alarm. See also Care Certificate Standards 3 and 9 on supporting independence and managing risk. A workplace will have their own specific procedures and actions to be taken into the event of a fire. You must make sure that you familiarise yourself with these procedures. If you work in someone's home, make sure you familiarise yourself with escape routes and agree with your employer 
what you would do in case of a fire. Sometimes there may be increased risks in an individual's home that need to be aware of and they may choose to smoke, for example. Working safely and securely. In order to stop intruders and prevent individuals from becoming victims of crime, good security measures are important. Your organisation will have security procedures in place, so ensure you familiarise yourself with them. Your employer may also have guidance or advice about safe working. Ask your manager about this. Examples of security measures include challenging any strangers you find on the premises or in restricted areas, requiring visitors to secure premises and sign a visitor book, setting alarms where they are fitted, checking the identity and of individuals who ring and ask for information. If your workplace is small, outside doors should be locked and fitted with a doorbell to ensure no unauthorised access. Never let in visitors or give out information unless you have consent to do so. If you are working in an individual's home, you can support them to get advice about how to make their home more secure. For example, by accessing information on the internet. And if you have a look. Signs and indicators of stress in yourself and others. Stress. Depression and anxiety lead to millions of lost working days. Stress can be both positive and negative. Some pressures and challenges are good as they can help us to work more effectively. But negative stress, such as undue pressure, overwork or difficult working conditions can affect our well-being and cause illness. Challenging events themselves are not the root cause of stress. It is the way that we see and think about the event or challenge that leads us to feeling stressed. Yes. Work-related stress is defined by the Health and Safety Executive, HSC, as the adverse reaction people had have to excessive pressures or other types of demand placed upon them. The signs and indicators of stress can be separated into different categories. Psychological or emotional, anxiety, anger, depression, low self-esteem, feeling helpless, sensitivity or tearfulness, irritability and indecisiveness. Psychological or physical, heart palpitations, stomach complaints such as irritable bowel syndrome, uneasiness and tension. Behavioural, aggression, increased substance misuse such as smoking or alcohol, sleeping more or less, changing in eating patterns and changes to mood and consequent the circumstances and situations that can trigger stress vary from person to person. Some people can take on lots of pressures and demands before they will show signs of stress, whereas others may be affected by situations and events more easily. This can depend on their personality, their ways of coping, and stress in their personal history. Stress triggers may include increased demands from others in the workplace or at home, Changes in working practices or new ways of practices. Changing to team members. Relationship issues. Unexpected changes relating to finance, personal circumstances or work. Challenging behaviour of individuals you support. Tiredness. Getting something wrong or being criticised. Managing stress. We all deal with and respond to stresses in very different ways and our reactions and strategies for responding to them will vary greatly. Some helpful strategies to deal with stress are taking more exercise or going for a walk, taking time out for yourself, doing something that you enjoy, taking a deep breath, counting down slowly in your head, removing yourself from a situation and taking time out, talking through how you feel with your line manager, attending any stress management courses or workshops available, engaging in relaxing activities whilst away from work, looking at your diet and substance intake, for example, caffeine and managing a sensible intake, undertaking self-awareness activities, talking through your stresses with a counsellor, talking to the human resource advisor or occupational health advisor if available in your organisation. Think about the events and situations that tend to cause you to feel stressed. It is very important to be aware of these things so that you can develop positive ways of coping and managing stress. Sometimes it might not be possible to remove the thing that causes stress, but if you develop ways of coping, then you are able to take the time to look after yourself 
so that the stress does not have too much of a negative impact on your health and well-being. Managing stress, managing stress well will reduce the negative effects of others, including the individuals you care for, your colleagues, your family and friends. Great work on finishing this What You Need To Know booklet. In this series, we also have the What You Need To Know activity booklet that follows on from this video.